Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 72 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm here with Pervez Ahmed. Yeah, good to be back, and uh, welcome back, listeners. Um, lots to talk about today. It's been a busy couple of months. <laughs> yeah, I have to say the least. <laughs> uh, there's always so much going on. It's, it's, so it's, much- it's kind of interesting because we, we just, you know, life sort of intervened in when we were going to recording this and we originally planned this as our uh, you know sneak preview of the midterm elections it was that's and, right and then it became hey let's do the morning after the midterm elections then it became hey let's do the weekend after and now at this point we're kind of like hey it's it's a uh, christmas after the midterm elections i don't know when this episode <laughs> is going to drop at this point i'm so tired i've lost all concept of time but i think we're here that's the point that's right that's right and and, and j- like just for our listeners because i mean again news travels at the speed of light these days so uh, we are recording this on November 13th, um, and so to, to give you kind of a time capsule in terms of when. Yeah, and, and I guess it's a good problem that we are just really busy, so yeah. finding the time to sit down and, and you know, I, we're kind of like, uh, we're like Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, where, you know, okay. we, got, we got busy lives, and, you know, we'd like to come back and do another season of Sherlock, but, you know... <laughs> Life is life is busy, but we're here. We're making time. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. And and that's right. I just compared myself to either Benedict Cumberbatch or Martin Freeman. Either of those. I'll take is, either. Yeah. It's still extremely presumptuous, <laughs> but that's what I just did. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, so I guess uh, like and, and I, I know one of the things we had also talked about was that this was meant to be kind of a fifth anniversary episode because we did hit our fifth anniversary yeah, last month. It's crazy. Yeah. Five years ago uh, is when it all started. And uh, uh, a lot has happened in those five years. And we've been fortunate to have some amazing guests. Yeah. Well, I mean, we started out our very first show. uh uh, was uh, Sidi Osama Cannon, and he's undergoing uh, a very serious health challenge right now. And that's right. I, I mean, we haven't kind of. I mean, we haven't really talked about it, but I mean, obviously, it's been alluded to. And uh, I imagine for most of our listeners, if not all, you know, uh, people are aware of his uh, combating ALS. Uh, he was diagnosed a little over a year ago, so it was last September, September of what, 2017. And uh, yeah, um, a lot has happened in that regard. Um, he's and, and and you know, I, I'll I'll be I'll be forever, eternally grateful that he 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 was our uh, you know our very first guest. Just just on a wing and a prayer, we gave him the pitch, and he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And and he set us off on I think a a very uh, blessed journey, you know. And I'll also be eternally grateful that. He allowed us to transcribe, uh, you know, his words mm-hmm. in, in sort of what I hope will be perpetuity. Exactly. You know, this amazing man and this amazing story mm-hmm. that will continue to inspire people uh, for, for, for a long time to come. That's right. And, and, you know, people always ask me because of my own personal affiliation with him and with Tatleaf about how he's doing. I mean, he's in, you know, wonderful spirits. Um, obviously... Uh, you know that the the, uh, the uh, unfortunately like the disease takes its toll and so you know he is suffering physical setbacks um, uh, you know uh, but uh, he's he's there uh, in terms of cognition and and mental function so uh, but uh, yeah I mean like it does take a toll on his physical body and so um, you know, obviously uh, thoughts and prayers are not enough but you know we we, we do pray for his well-being and for the well-being of his family. Um, so thank you to uh, Osama, and not only for the work that he's done, but also, like you said, I mean, for uh, you know t- allowing this show to be the canvas with which we were able to preserve and capture um, his life story and, and the work that he's done and the work that he continues to do. So, uh, yeah. 
Well, and and it's been a five year journey where uh, we really have been able to talk to such. I mean, I this is sounds embarrassing, but truly, like I was glancing back at our archives and I was like, oh yeah, we talked to we talked to them. That was mm-hmm. like, oh, that's right, we talked to so and so, you know, and and. Uh, it, it's it, it it blows my mind. It really does, you know. And, and that's right. And um, uh, um, can I put you on the spot and ask you if you had any sort of favorite episodes or favorite moments in in, in those five years? Oh my gosh! Um, I mean, there's just so many, right? Like you said, I mean, to to, the, to kind of look back at our archive. You know, I I'm I'm not gonna say I have any favorites because that would do a disservice to everybody yeah. who's come and spent time with us. Yeah. But certainly the, the, the ones I always uh, enjoy are the personal narrative episodes mm-hmm. where people talk about their journeys. You know, we, we just, our last episode with, with Dr. Ali Atai was amazing. And the feedback on that episode has been just That's uh, right. phenomenal. But, you know, yeah, we talked to Sana Amanet and she's talking about uh, being at Marvel. You know, we talked to uh, Dino Obadala, mm-hmm. you know, uh, um, over lunch, yeah, over lunch. You know, <laughs> these, are, these are surreal, yeah, uh, sort of things that that we've been able to to experience. And you know, uh, I've told you all along that for me, I view this show as being sort of we're weaving the tapestry mm. of of the the many facets of the American Muslim experience. And I think we've done that. I think I think there's a lot of threads that we haven't woven in yet, mm-hmm. and I hope we do get there. But uh, I, I, I certainly don't think you can look at the, the catalog, our 70 plus episodes, and say that uh, it's it's in any way monolithic. That's right. That's right. Which was the intent of, of the show to begin with, right? I mean, um, we, we wanted to kind of highlight and showcase the diversity within the Muslim, the American Muslim community. And I think um, we've done that, not only with the kind of scholars and thought leaders we've had, but artists and journalists. Uh, comedians musicians uh you name it right so um you know you know authors books it's yeah. what's amazing to me is you look back on the five years we that we started to now and look at the fact that we've got two muslims are about to be sworn into congress we've got a a muslim comedian who's one of the biggest stars on netflix we've got a muslim actor who's playing a, a superhero villain but he's not a muslim villain He's cool. just played by Riz Ahmed. Oh, right, right. And Muslims are everywhere. It's amazing. And, Riz, and you're, you're and you're talking about Venom. In Venom. Ah, yeah. right, right. You know, a it, movie I haven't seen yet, but I know you have, and I, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's uh, when you look at the macro, right? I mean, we it's easy and important to to look at the the sort of microaggressions and things like that that the Muslim community continues to deal with, no mm-hmm. doubt. Mm-hmm. However, on the macro level. It's astonishing, right? It, 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 Shahid Amanullah, one of our f- f- prior guests, said it mm-hmm. on Twitter, and he was he was paraphrasing somebody else. Who, who I I wish I could remember their name, but if you feel down, <laughs> just think about the fact that Mike Pence is going to have to swear in two Muslims on the Quran. That's right. And, That's right. You know, maybe giggle a little bit at the <laughs> the you know the synchronicity of that. That's right. That's right. And I I, I guess we're kind of teasing. Uh, the sort of uh, the, like the fact that we uh, or what you alluded to at the beginning, uh, this was meant to be kind of a uh, also a recap of the uh, midterms, uh, but uh, which we'll, I, I know we'll definitely get to talking about. Um, pro- probably not you know get into the minutia of it, but a- as an aggregate, um, you know, and the numbers still continue to kind of come in, right? Yeah. Just yesterday they called Arizona. Yeah. Just yesterday, so what? Like a week after the election, just about. Yeah, yeah, and there's still recounts in Florida happening for two very important races. Yeah, and I I would expect both of those, the Senate and the gubernatorial race, will go to the Republicans eventually. But mm. uh, regardless, Arizona is no less of an earthquake, mm. and I think that shouldn't be understated. I mean, the, the look. So, in your assessment, was the blue wave truly a wave, the or was it a was puddle? As some people, to me, it's funny, right? Because on election night, you had James Carville, uh, famous political, uh, you know, uh, uh, Svengali, yeah. uh, James Carville. Who was in fact, he, I think he was broadcasting from San Francisco. He was here in San Francisco. Yeah, so he was on right. MSNBC, mm-hmm. and he says, this ain't, this ain't going to be a blue wave. Ain't no blue wave here, right? 
And and I was like, dude, it's like four o'clock in California. Like, what, what are you talking? Like, don't don't. I'm not saying it won't be, but like, it seems a little early. Yeah. And indeed, a week later, you know, you still got people like, oh, it wasn't a blue wave. I'm like. Do you, how are you defining a blue wave? Like, do you, are you saying I did not physically drown in water, therefore it was not a blue wave? Because we're, we're looking at the Democrats uh, getting somewhere close to 38 seats uh, when all is said and done. Which, you know, if you remember the the pre-election prognostication was well, if you hit 40. That's a blue wave. Okay, so 38 is not then, right? And this is the biggest gain by uh, Democrats in any election since Watergate. Oh, wow. Since Watergate. Right. right. So, so yes, it was absolutely a blue wave. Right. Again, if a Democrat wins the Senate in Arizona, you might have a blue wave. That's true. Good point. <laughs> Jeff Foxworthy uh, might say, you know. <laughs> if the Texas senator who is a Republican wins by one point, you might have a blue wave. <laughs> Which he did, right? Ted Cruz won. It was like, like two points, yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah. Right, and so. I mean, you know, and, and again, even the so called losers uh, in this case, in, in particular, like in the Texas Senate race. Um, Beto, Beto O'Rourke, um, he's on his way. I mean, he's a, he's a rock star he's, already. He's going places. It's you know, I when focusing on Arizona again. Yeah. Right? So we have Kirsten Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, excuse me, uh, winning the seat that was vacated by you may remember Jeff Flake, who who Donald Trump essentially harangued and harassed the Republican senator Jeff Flake who was critical of Trump. So so Trump basically made the primary field so inhospitable that Jeff Flake's like, all right, I'm I'm out, right. Yeah, <laughs> and and Trump was gloating gleefully about this, and then cut to several months later. Here's a Democrat in that seat, and I'm just like, all we need is Rod Serling here to do a little narration and close this out because it is the perfect twist ending. That's right. You know, you have any impersonation of uh, Rod Serling? I, I do not. Okay, there's okay. only one Rod Serling, but but right. but it, it's beautiful. <clears throat> That's right. That's right. Um, you know, and, and I always marvel at the sort of um, the like the talking heads uh, in, in conservative media and the way they're able to twist themselves uh, into, a, you know, into all kinds of shapes and pretzels um, in order to sort of justify the fact that, well, it wasn't as big of a gain or it wasn't as big of a loss for Republicans because then they go back to 2010, uh, Obama when the Democrats lost like 60 to 70 seats or something, close to 70 seats. I mean, I mean, no doubt. Yeah. Right. But think about this. In two years, mm -hmm. Donald Trump lost a third of the gains that uh, that were made by Republicans during the Obama years. Over over mm -hmm. Obama's eight years, they lost nationwide, right, in state houses and things like that, about 1,000 seats. Right. Uh, so in two years, they've already lost more than 300 of those seats. So what does the changing of the tide mean then? I guess, you know, speaking in aggregate terms, now that the House is controlled um, by the, by the uh, Democrats, and yeah, I think in the Senate, it's like 51 to 46 or something? 52. It, I don't know. It, it's going to be very, very close. I think the okay. net gain yeah. that the, the because the Republicans will gain, but it's not going to be the four or five, six seats they were hoping. It'll be like two. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so what does this mean? It means that that nothing's going to get done. I mean, that's just the reality, mm -hmm. right? In in terms of legislation. However, if you are someone who cares about some. Uh, modicum of checks and, checks and balances. Well, we're going to have uh, quite a bit more than a modicum because because the suddenly, like we we've been spoiled by the last two years because the the House Republican leadership basically just agreed to collectively look the other way and whistle, while while Trump <laughs> does whatever he wants, and it, it's it's baffling to me because it's just they 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 willfully hand it over. I mean, it's like how do you say how does a dictatorship happen, mm. right? And this is not a dictatorship that we're in right now, but my God, we've just shown how easy it is to potentially have one. That's my point. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because mm. essentially, they they're just like, no, we're not we're not uh, we're not going to do that. Hey, did you hear the president is like making money off of things that he's not supposed? To? Yeah, m maybe I don't know. I guess we're not I know. gonna look at that though. You know, like just the other day, I was I was I was going back and I was reading that New York Times piece about the corruption um, that has been you know systemic within the Trump organization for the last you know three decades, four decades, um, and 
you know, it was like, a, it was a report that was two years in the making, maybe years in the making, and now it's forgotten news. Yeah. Well, because, I mean, it's just, there's just so much stuff. There's just so much stuff, yeah. There's just so much stuff. You know, and, and the last couple of years, in my opinion, have been a, a, a very useful gut check, you know, because... Uh, at least for me, I mean, a, you gut, know, a gut check of our democratic institutions. Well, I mean, or? just on an individual person okay. level, okay. where where you know, I have my partisan leanings. I don't think I'm a blind partisan, and I try not to be. Right. And these last few years have shown me what it's like when you are. Mm. And and I I say to myself, I'm like, well, if a guy I supported was doing even a third of this stuff, I'd be raising holy hell about it. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I can say that honestly right you know i wouldn't be like well but right and we saw so much we've seen so much well but what about ism right <laughs> that's right which is that's right. ridiculous and i've had uh conversations on on social media despite myself i've had conversations on social media with really diehard uh trump supporters and and it's a baffling really worrisome mm. thing you know when i because because it's just there's no getting through there's no being like well what about this right this thing that he did it, you know well i think what makes what makes conversations with entrenched trump supporters even more difficult is the fact that what we've seen in the last 2 years now um, and obviously th- th- you know some of these things go back before trump and 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 aren't just limited to the past two years, but there's no there's no notion of agreeable objective truth anymore. Right. And I think to me, and I've said this time and time again, um, perhaps not on the show, but to me, the biggest casualty of the Trump presidency has been the erosion of objective truth and objective reality. Yeah. Right. When we don't have a set of discernible facts that we can have a conversation around what do you have right you have alternative facts yeah right you have a what is it a a, a post-truth america you have a you so so it's very difficult to have conversations where you have the other side that essentially says well that's fake news and just dismisses anything that doesn't either mesh with their worldview or um, you know, um, contradicts anything that the president says. Yeah. So I mean, that's what makes I think conversations really, really difficult. And and that's what I mean by a gut check, right? Mm-hmm. Because you say to yourself, "Well, I don't ever want to be in that position," you know. Right. I'd like to believe that I'm intellectually secure enough with myself, where you say, "Well, here, this is what I think," and then you say, "Well." Uh, here's what the data says. Mm-hmm. And I would say, oh, you know what? I was wrong. My mm-hmm. bad. Right. You've made a compelling argument. That doesn't mean I'm blowing in the breeze. But if somebody makes a compelling argument, I mean, I tell my students this all the time, right? I say, don't start your research with your mind made up. Mm-hmm. Let your research guide you to where you want to end up. That's, right. that's how That's intellectually honest. That's right. That's Deep, right. And, and, and I tell them, you know, I, I say this uh, every election time. I have kind of the same spiel now mm-hmm. that I give my students. And I say, you know, we really are, have become more polarized, more partisan. And I say, Definitely. You know, we've, we've lost the ability or the willingness to just sit down and talk. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because social media has robbed us of uh, an essential ingredient in empathy, which is looking at somebody's face. Mm, that's right. And and having to sort of right. deal with the ramification. If, if I say, oh, you're stupid, and you react a certain way, then I say, oh, I feel bad. I should. Yeah. You know, and I say, look, instead of yelling at each other in all caps on, on Twitter, uh, you know, talk to me. Say, hey, let's go get some coffee. Yeah. Are, are you around here? Let's, let's uh, you know, uh, let's let's uh, uh, have, have a latte and let's talk. Right. You sit across from somebody, it's harder to scream at them. Yeah. Right. And right. you might just be willing to hear them out. Uh, we've lost that, you know, mm-hmm. and I think I think I go back and forth, and and you've heard me wax on about this on the on other shows too. Uh, has social media made us better or worse? Right. Right. And I still don't know because yes, there are pluses, but man, there are a lot of minuses. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And and I mean, it, it, these things are still so recent that we don't know the full implications, uh, you know, as to what they do to our discourse. Yeah. Um. You know, and only time will tell. But. Uh, like I said, I mean, going back to this idea of no objective truth or reality, I mean, to me, it's 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 a real 
crisis of a, of a epistemology, right? Mm. Where we don't know, uh, where, we, where we just can't agree on, like I said, objective truth and reality when it comes to things. Um, you know, the, the Washington Post has that ticker, right? Where they count the number of lies or untruths that the president has has stated in one, in, you know, in, in some form or fashion. And it's like 6,400 or something, right? Uh, and that's just as an objective fact checker. It's not partisan. But you know what, though? I, I think we know. We know intrinsically what is true. And we know when we're trying to delude ourselves into thinking something isn't. You really? But I, I think we can say that comfortably, uh, you know, sitting here on the West Coast. But I mean, you, you know, going to the heartland, I mean, and, 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 and looking at the entrenched Trump base, do they know that? You know, there, there's a... Because, I mean, to me, it's like things that were, you know, within the deep recesses of, you know, the dark uh, web are now mainstream, right? Flag, uh, fa false flag operations, right? That was what, um, the like, the talking heads on the right were saying about the Florida uh, bomber you know or the synagogue shooting in Philadelphia. John Adams said... Pittsburgh, sorry. John Adams said, mm -hmm. facts are inconvenient things. Uh, facts are stubborn things, right? Mm. And 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 what does that mean? It means that you can you can construct a reality, but 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 the real reality is going to poke it poke itself in, right? Whether you like it or not. You know, th there's a scene in the Matrix, or the movie The Matrix, which is now almost twenty years old. Can you believe it? Wow, uh, uh, that's nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, that is nuts. I remember that was like cutting edge dvd technology when it when it when, yeah, it, was when, when it was on a home best video selling dvd of all time for a little while there. oh right and, uh, right and now because that was like your demo disc that's right you know? yeah yeah i remember that but um i'm sure you know the scene J joe pantoliano he's cypher and he's uh he's in the matrix and he's talking to the agents he's mm -hmm. not going to betray them right he's the he's judas right if we follow the christ metaphor yeah and uh he's eating he cuts the food and he eats and yeah. he says you know i know that this is just like, uh, you know, whatever it, chemicals or whatever. Right. My brain mm -hmm. is wired to convince myself that it's delicious. Ah, uh, right. And, and he says, you know what? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> That's right. I remember right? that. He, he would rather be inserted back into the fictional reality mm. than to have to deal with 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 the real world that's know? right that's there's right. that that film has so much profundity but i i apply it so much with everything that we're going in now because people have constructed multiple matrices that they plug themselves into mm. in lieu of having to deal with a reality that's the only way to explain a president haranguing the public and the world about a, a mass invasion that's at our door three thousand miles away stumbling and fumbling and walking here That's right. and he basically convinces x number of people that, that we're in the walking dead and we got like a zombie apocalypse right. that's that's uh, you know if, if not for uh, curses if not for uh, a wall that's right you know and and the, the, i'll tell you i've i've interacted with people i'm saying because i've seen people post this stuff on uh -huh. their social and i just i say well, use your head think about this for a second right does this make sense to you and amazingly Either they came around or they just didn't want to have the argument, but I consider either of those a victory. Mm -hmm. Actually, like, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it is possible, right? Because facts don't stop being facts just because you want them to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the point I'm making. Yeah. And I think no matter how much, uh, you know, uh, we, we hear this sort of alternative facts and post-truth, I, I refuse, the human condition stubbornly pushes back on that. In mm. in, eventually right if not right away right right uh yeah i mean you know i i think of the exchange that jim acosta has you know with the like with the president which sure. is now yeah uh, there's actually the, the stuff uh, of legend uh, the stuff of legend right um eventually gets his uh credentials revoked and now actually as of this morning there's a lawsuit cnn is yeah. suing is suing the white house yeah and this will be very interesting. I'm curious. Yeah, six you know? named defendants, including the president and uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, and uh, who's that Fox News? Uh, 
producer who's now oh uh, uh, Bill Shine. Yeah, that's right, Bill Shine. Yeah, um, and and and, the, and, and let's the, see, let's see what the Supreme Court says. That's right, right. You it's all, it's interesting right? because the Supreme Court, obviously, it, 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 we should be concerned. Mm-hmm. No doubt. I, I mean, I'm not undervaluing at all the fact that you have uh, Justice Kavanaugh on there tilting the balance of the mm-hmm. court. However, what I've said for a long time, and I I. Still believe this will be the case. I think you're going to see John Roberts become much more of a swing mm. justice than I think. That's true. That's I think, true. I think Roberts. If we look at the conservative good. wing of the of, of, yeah. of the bench, look at he would rulings. be the one. Well, that just I look would... at his rulings that he's made. Right. You know? I think Roberts. First of all, Roberts is acutely aware of the fact that this is the Roberts Court, mm. and the Roberts Court will long outlive the Trump White House. True. I think he's acutely aware of the fact that his. Uh, uh, you know, mini fiefdom there is is one of the few things keeping this this whole enterprise that we have going on from mm. sinking into the morass of failed, uh, you know, experiments in democracy. You know? Right. So I I, mm. I maybe I'm optimistic. This is like you caught me on like optimism day, <laughs> but but I do I do believe that I I yeah. think that if you look at Robert, look mm. at how Roberts ruled on the Affordable Care Act. Mm. Right. He, That's right. He Roberts essentially kept it intact. Why? Because he didn't want the Supreme Court to be the thing that was pointed to as a, as taking away mm, health care for millions. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I I think I think he's a tactician. Mm. Uh, and I, and I think Roberts being sort of a classical conservative as opposed to whatever mutated strain we have now. I mean, I'll take it honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, That's I'll right. I'll take a conservative in the vein of. Of Joe Scarborough or Jeff Flake over over whatever is hang, using that label now because yeah. it sure isn't any conservative conservatism I'm aware of. That's right. Um, let alone you think back to the days of like William S. Buckley or something. <laughs> you know that sort of. No, oh, he's like a raging lefty now. That's <laughs> by today's metric. You know. That's right. That's right. Um, so wow. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, in in in, in addition to the sort of uh, crisis of, uh, as I said, epistemology that we face, I mean, it's it's just the daily erosion of, you know, just political norms hmm. that are, you know that that come from the White House and from this president that you know continue to shock me. I mean, hmm. perhaps I should be. Uh, not immune, but you should have built up a callus by now, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. But I haven't. Um, you know, we, we we sit here a day or two after Trump. You know, again uh, on the world stage. Um, you know, uh, goes to Europe to commemorate the hundredth anniversary of Armistice Day and the end of World War One, and you know, manages to you know essentially. Um, I was going to say piss Make himself. a mockery. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. The, the truth of it is, look, we the the what's happening now is is yes, it is numbing, mm-hmm. but it is having an impact, and it's not it's not it's it's having an impact on how he is perceived, not just abroad, but here. Okay. Uh, there's there's no getting around. The, what he did this past weekend, yeah, you know, the, right. Look, uh, twice, not just on Saturday, but on yet again yesterday, uh-huh. he blew off a military remembrance because of rain, and I'm like, what? Are you gonna melt or something? What's going on? With, you know, That's he doesn't right. want to get his hair wet. Yeah, which yeah. is comical and ridiculous, right? But you don't. Get and then to- tweeting, you know, at, at France about uh, how they were. You know, getting prepared to, or they were they were learning German. Had it not been for you know, and, and the, U.S. But, intervention, but honestly, like how did that turn out? I, you know, what's funny is every time he goes off on Twitter, I'm yeah. just like, oh, there goes Veruca again, and I'm I mean Veruca Salt from from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know, that, wow, that's, that's a deep that, cut. That, that rich girl who's just always throwing tantrums because the 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 pattern is clear now. Everybody knows it. Other countries know it. That mm. when he's in person, mm-hmm. he's you know, he, it's uh, he's, he's, he's awesome. like. He, he's like uh, he's like Shy Ronnie mm-hmm. from from Saturday Night Live, and then the, you leave the room and he's like doing doing gangster rap freestyle, you know. <laughs> like uh, everyone knows now. That's the thing. There's there's there is no there is no subtle mystery here. There is no oh he's playing chess while everyone is playing checkers. Mm-hmm. It's like no everyone else is playing checkers and he's like playing tiddlywinks in the corner. It, everyone knows it. 
Mm, except is, his base. I mean, except the dirty. Like, de- honestly, yeah. honestly, yeah. here's here's my <laughs> hot take. Sure. I don't care about the lament of the white working class voter anymore. I, I'm tired. All right, yeah. we get it. Right. Some of y'all, a lot of y'all, racist. That's it. I'm not saying all y'all. Yeah. But a bunch. Right. Okay. Right. I don't care. Okay. I care about the vast. See what you've done. You've got a Midwestern saying y'all. That's okay. right. Uh, uh, yeah, Zucky is, yeah. <laughs> but, I, I mean, look at look yeah. at this last election. Did you notice how Democrats swept the Rust Belt? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, there you go. Wisconsin, yeah. You know, Wisconsin is like a great example. You know, Mitt, Mitt Romney got more votes than Trump did in Wisconsin. Okay. Nobody talks about that. You know, like, right. Nobody like talks about this, that. this is the thing, right? There's been this this illusion, and I mm. say illusion because that's exactly what it is, of, of invincibility. Why? Mm-hmm. Because Trump sort of came in and and nobody saw it coming, right? But he he's he's the Mr. Bean president. He's 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 you know you know what I mean? He's 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 Inspector Cluzo, where he stumbles around, walks around, he accidentally solves the crime, and suddenly people are like, Oh, this guy's a great detective. That's right. That's Trump. He 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 walked in, you know, a bucket fell on his head, he rammed into a wall. Somehow he managed to get himself elected president. Nobody saw something like that coming. And so Including him. Including him. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so suddenly he's Superman. No political gravity it took a while to yeah. assert itself but it's happening right uh, i'll tell you i i if i were to bet money i'd say he still gets reelected but well and and and, and why do i say that because presidents tend to get reelected mm. Mm. um but i think the odds of that are less now than they were 2 weeks ago mm. all right I, I still am fully confident that the Democrats will find a way to to out Cluzo, Cluzo, and that's right, and and, steal. and run Hillary again. Yeah. So, yeah, you know they'll snatch defeat from the jaws of victory yeah. as they tend to. But uh, you know what? I think the Democrats having the House is a big, big, big deal, and I do not undervalue that at all. It's it's massive. Right. People don't realize what a big deal it is because it's all coming out. And I'll tell you something yeah. else. That's why Trump has been. Uh, you know, uh, unhinged, a unhinged little. Like he knows, Literally. he can see the future. He knows what's coming. You yeah. know, he doesn't know. He he doesn't know necessarily what's coming. Right. But he knows what he's done. Yeah. He knows yeah. everything he's done. That's right. Are you seriously going to tell me that Donald Trump has not skirted the edges of of ethics and legality for decades? Right. It's all coming in the wash. Look, Michael Cohen. Who I'm certainly not going to defend. Michael Cohen, who is Trump's former lawyer. Right. He, he was smart. Yeah. He was smart to cut bait. Yep. Suddenly yep. he's all... Michael Cohen tweeted the other day, I'm watching Michelle Obama give this interview and I, I can't wait for somebody to unite us the way the Obamas did. I'm like, are we through the looking glass here? Like, right. <laughs> up is down, yeah, black I, is white. I missed that. Yeah we're, yeah. we're in the sunken place or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right, right. But, but my point is, Cohen knows he knows where the bodies are buried. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All these people know. David Pecker. Everyone's turning on him, right? I right. mean, it's, you can't demand unquestioned loyalty and give none because mm-hmm. this is the inevitable result. Right. And, and, and you're right because I think the big unknown in this, in spite of the changes at the, at the Justice Department, is the Mueller investigation sure. and what that unveils, right? And, because and, that's and let's game about that to happen. So, so Trump put his... His, uh, you know, Luca Brasi, he, he installed him, right? Okay. Whitaker. Uh, Matt Whitaker, yeah. right? And let's let's say, first of all, Whitaker is speaking with ethics officials about possibly recusing. Let's imagine the tweet storm is going to ensue with that. But let's say he doesn't. Yeah. Let's say he kiboshes the investigation even. Okay. The Democrats have already said, okay. We have subpoena power. We have, we'll just call Robert Mueller in front of us and he will testify in front of the world everything that he discovered. You don't think Mueller's got a few hard uh, pen drives and thumb drives that he's stashed away? He's not stupid, you know? Right. Like, you, you read interviews with people who were part of the Watergate investigation. They were talking about how, uh, you know, when the Saturday Night Massacre was unfolding, they were sneaking out. They were yeah. uh, putting uh, file folders in their jackets and pants legs and things like that. Now you don't even need that. Now you're like, upload to cloud. Yeah. That's right. 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 I mean, this this is why. Think about this. Mm-hmm. This is why Donald Trump on Saturday decided that the optics of not going to this military thing mm-hmm. 
were were not as bad as all the the stuff that's bounced around inside his head. He's more worried about that than how not going to the, the thing is perceived. Wow! Because all the talking heads right. are like it's a, it's yeah. it's like a jump ball. That's right. Uh, it's the most easy thing. You show up. You show up for half an hour. Mm-hmm. You say a couple things and you go. He think about it. What would cause you to not do that? Because it you know it's um it's the it's the uh, the the weight of worry, right? Hmm. That's right. It's like it's like. Well, that's ever, good news. You ever have yeah. this happen uh, where where uh, somebody somebody says to you, "Hey, uh, uh, are you free later? I uh, I need to talk to you." You ever have something like that happen? Mm-hmm. And so and you're like, "What about?" And it's like, "Oh, well, yeah, we'll talk." <laughs> right. So now for the next however long, that's right. that's you're right. just like, "Yeah." What? Well, that's Trump now. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. He knows. He knows. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Fascinating. Yeah. Well. Hopefully, hopefully something comes of it. Um, I, I, I tend to be a little bit more skeptical, but we'll see, you know? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, guess, I, I guess we'll reconvene. We've caught you on a good day and me on a bad day. So, yeah. But, <laughs> we'll flip but a coin fine. next time yeah. and we'll, we'll switch. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I guess only time will tell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 well I mean, you know, uh, we'll reconvene. And I mean, it, hey, you know what? We should reconvene like the second week of January. Mm. Once, once the new Congress is in, because, mm. because they're going to rattle off like sixteen subpoenas in the first like twelve hours. We shall see. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, I guess we'll have to. Uh, I guess put a pin in, in, in it yeah. uh, as far as uh, seeing what the outcome of that looks like. Um, what else? Um, well, I, 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 like you alluded to it at the beginning, but we've uh, we've got. Um, Wanted to talk about Hassan, you know, Hassan Minhaj, yeah. his show and his success. Um, you know, I, I, I think I tweeted this or I, or I mentioned it on Facebook or something. But, you know, to me, just watching the shows, I, I'm assuming you've watched a yeah, few yeah, or absolutely. all. Yeah. Uh, you know, just to me, like, it, it was seeing what representation feels like. You know, true representation, right? For me, as, a, as, a, as an Indian, as a Muslim as a, as a, as a, as a child of immigrants to see Hassan Minhaj there, um, you know, where it was like for the first time it felt like, you know, I was the audience and I was in on the joke and anyone who wasn't privy to that needed to be kind of clued in for yeah, the first it's, time. It's sort of it was like, like it's him- sort of like, uh, being black in the audience of the Apollo theater. Right. And you know, whenever there's, it's like a deep, joke about black culture you kind of like, glance over at the white guy and be like uh-huh, uh-huh. you don't know if you're supposed to laugh or not <laughs> right right and, and and i and i feel like that's what yeah it, that's what i feel when i when i when i when i've been watching the show um just the insight all right i mean him you know using expressions like auntie and uncle or saying lorta <laughs> without translating it right yeah. uh and then just kind of cluing people in after the fact um i mean to me that's beautiful say what you will about you know his politics or his, his where, where he stands on certain social issues, which some it, like some Muslims may find you know questionable in with regards to their orthodox positions on those issues. Um, and I'm not here to comment on that, but mm-hmm. I think that you know you can't deny the fact that what he is doing uh, is really you know cutting edge in terms of representation of. Muslim American Muslim, you know, voices uh, in a mainstream setting. It it it's it's astonishing. Yeah. I've, I've never seen anything like it. And yeah. and uh, I mean, I, I guess it's okay to say Hassan is a friend. Yeah, you know, I, I who we have I mean, tried. I, I've, I've, yeah. I, I've reached out to him, and and honestly, the, uh, this is to me the the most amazing thing about his rise is he's he's too big for us now, and that's awesome. Like I don't I don't even. That's that's fine, you right? Know? Right. Uh, but it's it. What's cool to me is first of all having over the last, uh, you know, six years now, it's seen his his rapid ascent. That's right. Is astonishing. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I remember the first time I talked to him was for you know he had done a, a, a YouTube video with his comedy troupe Goatface where he. Um, it was it was making fun of uh, I want to say I want to say Abercrombie and Fitch no no even oh, before the okay. Ashton Kutcher thing okay. Abercrombie and Fitch uh, is like if you look at their their ads you know the the uh, artwork and stuff mm, yeah. in, in their stores it's like 
it's like uh, white with a side of, uh, you know, sour cream, you know. Um, and so he was making fun of that, and yeah. it's a very clever thing. And then, you know, from there he went to to uh, and he was hosting a show on MTV, and then of mm-hmm. course he was on he was on uh, uh, the Daily the Show, Daily Show, and, mm-hmm. and off we go, you know. But but uh, a couple this past uh, summer, I was teaching a public speaking class. One of the one of the things I talk about is the importance of of words in yeah. defining reality, changing reality. And so one of the things I have him do, I say name great speakers. I don't mean people you assume are great speakers. I mean people you've heard. So it could be via video recording or, or live, or whatever. But actual, you know, so you get like Martin Luther King and John mm. F. Kennedy and you know uh, uh, Barack Obama, etc. Hassan Minhaj. And so I wrote that down on the board. You know, I, mm-hmm. I took a picture and I sent it to him. I'm like, this is this is who they <laughs> listed. He's like, whoa, you know. Yeah. But that says something, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I think it's only going to get better. Yeah. It's only going to get better. You know, I, I think it's easy. I said this. It's easy to really uh, take this this curled up fetal position, woe is me posture. And sometimes it's warranted. But but big picture, we're winning. That's right. If demographics is destiny, we are winning. Mm-hmm. If demographic, Yeah, wow. I like that. Right? If Democrat... Wait. If demographics is destiny, we are winning. Yeah. It should be a new tagline for the show. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like it. I like it. it you know, you, you mentioned the first time yeah, Hassan Minhaj sort of crosses your radar. For me, it was actually even earlier. Maybe I want to say circa... Was it that Ashton Kutcher thing? No, no. It was before that. It was just maybe circa 2006, 2007. Oh, wow. And there was a YouTube video of like, I mean, like an MSA video that he had done. Hmm. called and, and you can still find it on youtube actually uh, it's called thank allah it's juma so kind of a take a muslim take on thank god thank god it's friday have you ever seen it i haven't it's really really good and, and and like i said you can still watch it very very young hassan minhaj with a group of like other muslim probably like fellow students at uc davis and they record this um like essentially like like think back to the 90s and like those msa skits right sure. and it's essentially like a 20 minute msa skit about going to friday prayers mm-hmm. and what that's like and i just remember even thinking back then just watching it not only seeing his talent but also just the talent uh, of the video a- a- as a whole and just thinking how wow like i mean this is this is better than any quote unquote msa skit video i ever grew up watching or i was ever a part of hmm. so seeing him kind of always kind of pushing the envelope and and really bringing you know uh, like a real spirit of excellence to what he does um and so i you know i was i was i was a fan i was a fan without even you know knowing that he, he would ever make it to the national stage you hmm. know we're talking about a like i said an amateur msa video so um anyway yeah definitely i mean yeah um it's great to see hassan minaj and and like you said i mean i think the the future is bright and his rise is only beginning yeah, yeah and 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 you know i mean i think yeah. this this idea of taking ownership of your own experience of yeah. your own narrative. Mm-hmm. I think that's so crucial, especially when we look at... I mean, I don't know if you had this experience, but certainly for me, when I was in high school, yeah. I would shy away from uh, foregrounding my, my ethnicness. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. I wasn't ashamed of it. Right. But I didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and I see kids these days... Kids these days... <laughs> I've said that twice on two podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm almost forty. I guess I can say kids these days now, yeah. right? Uh, I don't see that same issue as as much now. Mm. And maybe part of this, admittedly, you know, we're here in uh, the most liberal part of the country, you know, so there isn't that same. There is more more open mindedness in general. But, That's right. That's right. But I, I don't know. I, I I think you know, you look at a, a show like like Patriot Act. And it is informative and engaging mm-hmm. and intelligent. Oh, and by the way, it's by somebody who's unabashed in their brownness. Yeah. And and these are little things. These yeah. are little things that matter. That's right. Um, this, is, this is not a perfect metaphor, but I mean, you know, I remember when I was a kid and uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine started. 
and uh, that show, the captain on that show is uh, Benjamin Sisko, mm-hmm. played by Avery Brooks. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time you had a person of color leading a Star Trek show. Mm-hmm. But what was so amazing about that show was that it was never he was never the black captain. He was the mm. captain who happens to be black. In fact, Avery Brooks used a term. He didn't say black. He said brown. He said a brown person. Uh, the fact that I'm... And if you ever listen to Avery Brooks talk, he has this sonorous way of talking. But the fact that I am a brown person. And I, I've... I, because of him, I incorporated that into my vernacular. Because I, I, mm. I love that, right? Yeah. Because people are not black and white. Right. They're different shades of brown. <laughs> That's right. That's right? right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that... The, the, how many kids... Watched that show growing up, and they didn't think twice about their the fact that the captain was brown, mm-hmm. right? That's right. How many like that was a that was apparent, obviously. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, and this is the thing, right? Because because we're transitioning a little bit. We 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 live in this age now where everyone, uh, not everyone, many people decry, oh, social justice warriors. Oh, why does uh, this character have to be a woman? Why does this person have to be of color? And it's like. You know why? Because that's the world we live in. Mm. And look at how important that's, that is to kids growing up. Maybe right. it doesn't matter to you, but that's great. What about other people who it does matter to? That's right. right? And so I think, I think uh, uh, Hassan Minaj is just a part of that. That's right. That's right. You know? And, and, and I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, not so much related to what you've been saying or what we've been talking about, Hassan Minhaj, but what I appreciate about him also is that as unabashed as he is about his brownness, he's also equally unabashed about the fact that he is a practicing Muslim. Yeah. Um, you know, he was on Stephen Colbert recently, which I just saw the clip, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, where he talks about the internet, the, the, the internet, yeah. whatever. He's like, you know, check this internet. I'm drinking, you know, sparkling apple cider. It's not alcohol, right? Um, and, and, and I think even Colbert makes a point of saying, you don't drink alcohol, right? And so, um, but I... And so this is a conversation that I had recently with someone who will obviously remain un- un- unnamed, but also I'm going to, uh, I'm going to also withhold the name of the... Let's very- call them Lisa S. No, too obvious. L. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> um, very recently, he was privy to a dinner uh, in New York with Hassan Minhaj uh, and uh, a very, very, very prominent Muslim scholar um, I'll just say that and uh, who um, just we haven't had it on the show yet, but hopefully we'll be able to remedy that. Um, so that's probably more of a clue. Than <laughs> need. Okay. It, it's almost like the L. Simpson, Lisa S. kind of thing, right? <laughs> exactly. But anyway, uh, and you know, this is so this is someone who is deeply concerned about, <clears throat> um, you know, not only Muslim representation, but about doing it right. Sure. You know, doing it right and being you know, um, is showing fidelity to the tradition and to the faith. This is the the, the scholar. No, no, I'm saying uh, like Hassan Minhaj in his conversation I, with I this scholar. That, that's you know, what he expressed. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's... exactly. And 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 you know, and in turn, you know, this very prominent Muslim scholar, um, you know, said you know genuinely likes Hassan Minhaj and likes the work he's doing. Um, and so, just to, like for me, just the. The, the occurrence of that happening hmm. um, about the fact that Hassan Minhaj sort of seeks him out while he's in New York and they kind of visit every time that, they, that, 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 that their paths cross um, shows me the kind of genuine care and consideration that Hassan Minhaj has hmm. about truly representing, you know, and, and being representative of a Muslim voice. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's, you know, again, there may be some missteps along the way, um, and and you know, and you know, some Muslims may agree with his positions, others may not. But nonetheless, you have someone who genuinely cares about doing the right thing. And and I just want to put that out there, you know. And that and, is important. And, yeah. I, and I think yeah, it is. Uh, you know, uh, that is especially challenging because you know the 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 minternet as he described it which is yeah. so apt it's it's extremely challenging it is. you know i mean it is. Uh, and unforgiving it, it really is you know and and i have well i, I won't say their name but yeah. i have a friend and you know who it is they're very well known in the in the community and they they have uh, just as much visibility as Hassan minaj and in these platforms and the amount of grief this person takes uh by 
people who question every single thing that they do, it 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 wears you down. I mean, it wears me down, and it's not I'm it's not directed at me, but as a friend, I'm like, like why why would you want that? You know what I mean? Right. Like like there there is this unfortunate trend towards oh well, so and so just wants to be famous, mm-hmm. and my response to that is always, and certainly this is the older I get, I'm like. I don't think and I don't think anybody should want to be famous because it just sucks, right? You know, yeah. Because because people just be taking shots at you, yeah. You know, yeah. There uh, is a dark underbelly. To yeah, things. and and, yeah. and you know, I, I this is not a exclusive to the Muslim community, but just in general, human beings we tend to build people up to knock them down. to knock them down, and right. and, and, uh, and there's some pride in that. There, yes, like and and collectively, there there Muslim social media, you know the. Uh, Certainly, the activist sphere uh-huh. is is fraught, you know, and and it's it's extremely fraught with people who who are trying to define Muslim Muslimness away from what it uh, by definition has to be, which is a, a spiritual component. Mm. I think once you once you remove the spiritual component, it it ceases to be exactly. It can be Muslimish, Muslim esque. Right. I don't know, but mm. it's not. Right. That's a really, really important point. I think is that is that um, unfortunately, what 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 happens, you know, especially in those circles, is that, and we've talked about this with like with Jahat and other guests we've had on the show, but it it, it becomes all about identity politics. Yes. You know. Yeah. A- as opposed yeah. to, um, you know, again, a fidelity to a spiritual tradition. Yeah, and and you know, the, and it goes to like what. Like, how do we define what is or who is a Muslim? Is yeah. it an is it an, 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 an identity alone, or is it well, like again, a fidelity to a tradition? I mean, look, this is maybe a conversation that's worth having because I don't believe we discussed it on this show, but yeah, you know, the, on the internet, there's that refrain: "Stay in your lane," right? Okay, and we see how that's used and abused, mm-hmm. right? and to some extent, we saw that with um, Imam Zaid Shakir when he uh, chimed in online in reference to the Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh hearing specifically about Dr. Ford and, and, her, and the and, accusations and, right. And the, the accusations that she levied against him. That's right. And, and he, he, he wrote a lengthy uh, uh, treatise yeah. that I, I will say I personally found problematic. Let me just put that out front. That being said, what I found even more problematic was just the ensuing dog pile that happened over the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours. That's right. Where really not not just spirited disagreement, but taking your disagreement, taking your indignation to a point that completely devalues the decades of service that this man has given to our community. That's right. It was embarrassing and and frankly it to me it's a black mark on on this whole notion of muslim activists that that uh, uh, has has sort of taken root. And, and we've seen this happen time and time again it happened I mean, uh, a few couple years ago with Hamza Yusuf with, with Sheikh Hamza yeah. exactly and the same thing with 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 the black lives matter so uh, and it will probably and I have a happen you again and I are on the same page That's right. vis-a-vis the, his initial statement correct you know what you, but i read that i said you know what mashallah uh, Imam Zaid, Imam Zaid. I don't agree with him on this. That we have to have room to be able to disagree on uh, on that level. That's right. That's right. But it's just there's this vitriol. Mm, there is, uh, and there is. and people take pleasure. It, there's this whole hashtag smash the patriarchy kind of thing, right? Thank you. Thank right, you. and yeah. and and you know. <laughs> We can't have reasoned conversations. You don't leave room for nuance and That's things like that. That's so important. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it's a really important point that you raise about the kind of, yeah, like general vitriol that we see, um, you know, uh, unfortunately among Muslim activists online. Um, and so, um, yeah, and I think the most recent example of that is what we saw with, <coughs> um, you know, Imam Zaid. And, and, and you know what? Let me add this, yeah. lest I be taken out of context. I think the patriarchy needs a little smashing, mm-hmm. but I just think that we need to make sure we, we don't get the pieces everywhere. You know, let's. Uh, you know, this is this is my point, right? There's, There's a conversation to be had. There is. It, it is it is and relevant it, and it's important, and it should be treated seriously. Right. Right. By all sides. Right. And there's just it almost seems like there's no room for a nuanced conversation anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. It's 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 it's, uh, it's you know every example of and and this will continue to happen where a scholar will put out something that you disagree with um 
And then it becomes this hashtag, like you said, smash the patriarchy, yeah. right? To just go after people. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I guess, I guess what we're trying to say here is like, we're cautioning people to be mindful of that, I guess. And, and, uh, you know, uh, what we digest and how we consume information and how we consume I, I think I conversations th online. I think stay in your lane is, is one philosophy, mm -hmm. but I think more helpful is recognizing that there are lots of lanes that are all headed in the same direction. And sometimes Hopefully, you yeah. slow down and let other people merge. And sometimes, <laughs> I mean, you know, like, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing, we've seen it over the last five years. We're seeing it now. The Muslim community in this country is evolving. Yeah. Uh, in, in good ways and, and, uh, to be determined ways. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not even going to say bad. I'm going to say, well, let's see where things go. Yeah. But I think if, if we, if we divest ourselves of the responsibility to be, uh, uh, emotionally mature, and intellectually honest, then then what's the point? We're just another screaming mob, mm. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, and I think when we're at a point where we uh, dismiss uh, the 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 the, way, the road paving that uh, our scholars have done yeah. here in this country, then I don't know what what has it all been for? You know, look look. The reality is that that Imam Zaid and and Sheikh Hamza. Uh, you know, they, for a while there, they carried the American Muslim community on their back. That's right. Uh, that's not an exaggeration. Yeah, it, absolutely not. Right? So, like I said, we lift people up to knock them down. I guess that's, that's right. I guess it's just their turn. That's but, right. But uh, that's not a good thing. That's yeah. not something we should be proud of. Absolutely. And, and you know, for, for, for all of us, we should be, you know, acutely aware of the fact that we truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I, I think now would be a, a, as good time as any to, to, to also mention the fact that, you know, we lost one of those giants um, yesterday um, in, in the passing of Dr. Suleiman Niang. Um, just as a personal note, you know, it was someone who, um, you know, and I don't even know if you know this, Zaki, but I had, you know, I had, I had reached out to him more recently. Uh, and when I say recently, I mean maybe a couple of years ago to, to have him on the show mm -hmm. uh, because I, I really wanted to have him on the show to capture not only his personal story and narrative, but also just the, just the, uh, you know, the work of a true historian, uh, especially as it relates to Islam in America. Um, and, 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 you know, and he, and he passed on yesterday. And so, I mean, to me, that just sort of underscores not only the importance of shows like this that seek to kind of capture the voices of those giants that we, of, of, of whose shoulders we stand on, uh, but, uh, you know, just goes to show you that, you know, I, I, I don't know what I'm saying here. I mean, I, I, I guess just not only the importance of the work, well, but maybe, also maybe, yeah. maybe you can talk a Sorry. little bit for people who are listening. Yeah. Um, what, what is the legacy of Dr. Niang? So a, a leading scholar of, uh, the history of Islam in Africa, but also a leading scholar of the history of Islam in the United States. In fact, um, one of you know one of the sort of seminal works on the subject of the history of Islam in the United States is exactly that. It's called the History of the United States by Dr. Suleiman Niang, and it serves as a wonderful primer um, and 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 an introduction really to um, you know the 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 history of Islam in this country, um, and and others historians and scholars have sort of taken that work and, and, and sort of, you know, as a scaffolding and has built and, and, and have built on it and have uh, really done some amazing work, but it really goes back to, um, and, and a lot of people cite that seminal work of Dr. Suleiman Niang. So, um, you know, he was just, you know, a, a near encyclopedia like uh, knowledge of history and history of Islam in, in the United States. And so, you know that 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 is who we lost, and mm -hmm. uh, um, you know um, Imam Zaid wrote a very wonderful tribute to Imam, you know, to Dr. Niang. Uh, I think I, I saw it on Facebook uh, yesterday or today. People can see that, and and just to see the uh, like uh, or, or or an insight into the legacy of the man, and um, you know he was some he was someone who had been suffering with health problems. In fact, I um, for those who 
have heard the Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah episode that we did a few years back. He mentions the retreat in Navasota, Texas, and uh, we had originally lined up Dr. Suleiman Yang to be one of the speakers. And uh, unfortunately, even back then, he had been suffering with health problems and was a, uh, was, una- was unable to attend hmm. and had to kind of cancel um, a few weeks before the event. And so, um, you know, um, you know, I, I, I think of what could have been had had Dr. Suleiman Yang been there, um, and and as wonderfully as Dr. Omer thinks back, and and he's always apt to kind of remind me whenever I see him about the, the just, 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 like just the impact that that retreat had on him, and and just the obviously the people that attended for those that did, um, but yeah, Dr. Suleiman Yang was supposed to be one of the speakers, um, and. Uh, you know, since then his health improved in the middle, and then more recently he had suffered a stroke. Um, you know, and, and I think the, well, one of the other things I did want to talk about as we talk about Dr. Suleiman Yang is the is the fact that I think we as a community have to do better when it comes to taking care of our scholars and taking mm-hmm. care of, our, of 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 those again whose so, who, whose uh, shoulders that we stand on. Because I remember a few months ago there was a GoFundMe campaign to kind of support. Um, the cost of health care related to, uh, you know, his, his, uh, his suffering. Um, and that's just a sad, rep- you know, that's just a sad reality of the fact that, unfortunately, a lot of our scholars, um, you know, aren't well taken care of. Uh, certainly, you know, he came from a world of academia. So, you know, I, I imagine Howard University compensated him and paid him. But, you know, for those especially that are involved um, you know, for in, in like nonprofit work or work at the local mosque, um, I think back to another guest, Imam Siraj Wahaj, and, and and when he was diagnosed with uh, with uh, um, prostate cancer, it was the same sort of uh, you know campaign online to kind of help with medical expenses because he didn't have any med- you know he didn't have health insurance, so you know as, I think it serves as a reminder that you know our scholars are getting up there in age. And, uh, you know, it, I think it, it rests on, our, on us as a community, as a collective, to make sure that they're taken care of. Yeah. And there we go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, you know, Dr. Suleiman Yang, you know, may he rest in peace and may, you know, God bless him in, in the, in, you know, in the, in the, in the life hereafter. Um, I think we'd be remiss not to, and this is going to be kind of an awkward transition, or maybe not so much, but uh, we also lost another legend yesterday. And I think for someone like, uh, for certainly me and Zucky. uh, And and most of the civilized world given, no, I mean, given given the reach that his his work had. I mean, Mm. Stan Lee. That's right. uh, Gone at 95 years old, a a giant. I mean, it tells you something that even as he, uh, you know, stretched into his 90s, we just assumed he was immortal. Mm. I, I think the idea of a day without Stan Lee, while obviously that 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 possibility grew greater every day that he lived, was still not something any of us is really ready to face. That's you right. know, that's right. Uh, I've I've said elsewhere that uh, I'm so used to seeing his his cameos in these Marvel movies that the first one without, uh, I I don't think I'm ready for it emotionally. You know, right? But. but um, you know, I, I was asked yesterday: Is there, is there, is there a, is there a spiritual way we can view the work that Stanley did? And uh, fascinating. And I said, I said, yeah. I said, um, with the great power, there must come great responsibility. What's more spiritual than that? Mm. Right. I, mm. I think I think the genius of what he did. I mean, obviously. Disney would say the genius of what he did is that he ensured that they would make billions upon billions of dollars, right? But uh, he he spearheaded uh, an approach to heroic fiction that was revolutionary. It was so revolutionary that we don't think of it as revolutionary anymore. And that is that he said, these people are humans. Mm-hmm. They have real concerns. They have real problems. Uh, and And whether you're talking about Peter Parker or Bruce Banner or Tony Stark or Reed Richards or, or, or uh, you know, uh, T'Challa or Steve Rogers, who he didn't create, but he did write for a big chunk of it. I mean, these are people who are normal. They chose mm. to do right mm-hmm. because it was the right thing to do. That's even, right. even at great personal cost. Uh, and they, they modeled goodness 
as something that was worth emulating, but that we could emulate. Mm. You know, I, I I always point to to the the distinction between uh, DC comics and, and I was going to say right. I mean, I mean, and, and I'm a big fan of DC comics too. But you look at a character like Superman. I mean, intrinsically, the problem people have had d- depicting that character is that he is. Uh, sanctified. Mm-hmm. He does good because he does good. Um, Spider Man is somebody who his road to heroism was steeped in uh, personal loss from ha- having chosen not to be heroic. Right. You know, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story, I mean, it, it, take everything aside, all the supervillains and everything else. You take the, his first appearance, the 15 page story in Amazing Fantasy 15 from 1963. And uh, uh, 1962, excuse me. And and what is it? It's this kid who's picked on mm-hmm. all his life. The only people who care about him are his aunt and uncle. He somehow magically, uh, fantastically acquires these superpowers. What's the first thing he does? He doesn't say, I'm going to go stop crime. He says, I'm going to show off. Mm. I'm going to make money. I'm going to make all those people who made fun of me realize how wrong they were. How, what's more human than that? That's right. right? And then... Ultimately, he's that given impulse. that yeah. impulse, yeah, yeah, yeah. the self-preservation, right. and and what happens? He has an opportunity to stop a burglar, and and he doesn't. Why? Because that's not my problem. Not I look out for number one, me. And what happens? That same burglar that he let escape eventually kills the one person who looked after him and loved him unconditionally, his uncle. I mean, it's it's an O. Henry fable. It's mm. so perfect. And 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 that's where we first got with great power. There must also come great responsibility. And I doubt Stan Lee even knew at the time that those that phrase would carry on forever and it would guide people's morality, right? And this is, you know, people point to uh, popular fiction, whether comic books or movies and everything else, and they say, oh, what a waste of time. I say, is it a waste of time, though? Yeah. If, if you're able to find... A guidepost that's worth following. Then isn't that good? It's some completely, completely separate from any religious context. If if you uh, see uh, Captain America d- uh, depicting a kind of uh, uh, morality that's worth emulating on screen, and you follow that, then isn't that something? That's right. That's the way I look at it. No, I think people who say that are are just they are not mindful of the impact of um, you know. Of, of of modern story of modern storytelling and and the impact that that has on shaping morality, yeah. shaping our world views, um, because I mean you know comic books are not only a quintessentially American medium, but they're also modern storytelling at its finest in the sense that it, they impart these uh, moral uh, uh, imperatives in a way that is relatable and in a way that is fantastic much like uh you know fables and fairy tales of yesteryears right and so you know that's what that's that that is stan lee and his contribution to dare i say civilization yeah right uh human history Mm -hmm. uh will forever be uh you know be uh, slightly directed by the footprint that Stanley left. Exactly, like, and like, whether you're a consumer of the medium or not, um, you know it, you you have you are familiar with the tropes. You are familiar with the characters. Uh, I, I say this in another context. You know, people often ask, or people often uh, wonder, well, why is it that? And this is going to seem like a stretch, but I'll, I, I promise I bring it back. Um, is you know why is it that the Quran, when it talks about hi- historical figures, why does it only deal with history in a very truncated manner? Right. For example, if you want to know about the story of Abraham, you know it, you don't go to a chapter, and 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 it and, and you know you're not going to find a personal narrative. Hmm. The only exception in the entire Quran. Is perhaps the story of Joseph, Yusuf, right. um, and and that is a chapter in the Quran, and you read it from beginning to end, and it reads like a like a high, like a Hollywood screenplay. Hmm. It has a beginning, it has a it has a a crisis and a, and a conclusion to that crisis, and a nice ending to the story, a, a satisfying resolution. Correct. Whereas if you go and you look at the story of Abraham or the story of Moses or Jesus. Not only are they scattered throughout the Quran, they're not in one place, 
but they deal with history in a very truncated fashion. And I said, well, you have to think back to 7th century Arabia, that you were dealing with an audience that already knew those stories in mm. detail. So when you said Jesus, they knew the story of Jesus. When you, when, you, when you referenced Abraham, people were certainly familiar and knew in detail the story of Abraham. So the Quran could sort of reference these figures hmm. um, and, and, and not have to go into any great detail about who they were, um, certainly not in a personal narrative format. And so I think much like that in, mo in, in, in sort of in, in more of a modern context, if I were to say Spider-Man, whether you're a consumer of the medium or not, you know, you know who that is. You hmm. know the story of, you know, a radioactive spider that bites this mild-mannered, you know, high school student. Or if I say Incredible Hulk or, you know, and the list goes on and on with regards to um, these modern fables. And so, you know, that's the sort of analogy that I give when I, when I try to explain why the Quran deals with historical figures in a truncated fashion. Because they're so familiar to the audience, much like... Spider-Man, whether again you're a consumer or not, is you are familiar with the character. You're yeah, familiar there's with a, there's a cultural shorthand. <clears throat> exactly. There exists. you go. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. And that's all attributed uh, attributed to Stan Lee. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, allow me to uh, throw in a shameless plug here. Uh, I uh, sat down on mic uh, just last night with my good friend Glenn Greenberg, who is a uh, former editor. At Marvel Comics, and so he had opportunity to work with Stanley, and uh, we sat down. We we I, I said yesterday, I was like, "Well, the Muslim guy and the Jewish guy are going to have an Irish wake for Stanley. Let's see how it goes." I think it turned I like out, that. I think it turned out great. So that is on the Nostalgia Theater podcast. Yeah. If you want to do a search for that, and uh, it's uh, we spent about an hour or so really uh, talking about the the outsized uh, impact that uh, he leaves behind him. So uh, R.I.P. Uh, to Stan Lee. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And um, I think that serves as a great segue as any uh, to kind of talk about uh, or bringing it, bringing it back to the show and talking about what, what we have in store for us. We've kind of reflected or waxed poetically about the last five years, or at least we tried to at the beginning, do some modicum of justice to the five years that we've spent doing the show um, in terms of what sort of lays ahead for the show, what, what, what lies ahead. Uh, ideas that we have brewing and cooking. Um, and one idea that I had, uh, and I shared this with Zucky, of course, and uh, was, it, was, was, was a way to kind of bring Zucky's two universes together, which is this show and his love and um, real expertise and knowledge of film and movies. Um, and so one of the ideas is to, um, in addition to the episodic kind of nature of the show and the episodes that we do and bringing interviews and, 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 and uh, some of our great thought leaders um, uh, on the mic, uh, on uh, what is it, um, on wax as it were, <laughs> um, is to uh, delve into some film commentary and film analysis. Yeah, I think, I think that's something that uh, we can look forward to. Yeah, so, you know, uh, right now we're tentatively calling it Movies That Matter. First up, The Delta Force, <laughs> followed by True Lies. Followed by the Delta Force too. I don't even know if that has. Much yeah, yeah, no. I mean, and, and it's funny you say that. You like you mentioned those movies in particular because, I mean, the idea is not just to do movies that, uh, well, certainly in those two instances, you know, paint Muslims in a negative light and talk about that because I think that's kind of been done. And and you know, I'm not making light of it, but you know, to me, it's more. I I would like to sort of cover movies that deal with faith, deal with religion, deal with, um, you know, certainly, and, and yes, you know, deal with American Muslims or deal with Muslims in, 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 in a certain light. Um, and so really that's just an idea right now that we have sort of yeah, germinating, well, I, but I, I expect that, uh, we'll, we'll pursue that, follow that thread. I think, I think, uh, there, there's, there's certain films that like every Muslim growing up, like when we were kids and anyway, yeah. like, Oh, this is like the, the Muslim movie, you know, like the message, basically. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's kind of it, you know, but, but things have changed. And, and yeah. uh, I, think, I think we've seen a, a, a growth. I mean, and this goes to what we were talking about earlier in the manner in which uh, the Muslim experience is depicted in, this, in, in the West. And, right. And not just depict, I mean, you know, and even moving beyond sort of the way that the Muslim experience is, is depicted to kind of talk about movies that 
impact our generation, hmm. that have had an impact on our generation, whether they deal with Muslim or Islam uh, per se. So, for example, like, again, just thinking at the top of my head, like a, a movie like Star Wars or M Empire Strikes Back that forms such a part of, uh, I mean, just a huge swath of the American Muslim um you know, population, certainly people of our ilk and our generation. Yeah. So to kind of talk about that, uh, to Muslims, uh, you know, analyzing the themes explored in Star Wars from the perspective of an American Muslim or from the perspective of two American Muslims. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of the idea. So, and again, uh, we'd love to hear from you, our listeners. Um, you can always write in um, and, and send some suggestions our way because we'd really love to kind of tackle that. And, um, Obviously, in addition to that, um, you know, we will continue to bring uh, voices and uh, some of the giants, as I said, whose shoulders we stand on and um, some of the up and coming stars within the American Muslim community. And we want to continue to do that. And so and uh, with that in mind, uh, why don't you put in a plug for our Patreon page? Yes, absolutely. Um, so please do visit. Uh, I know we still have listeners out there who, who haven't uh, made the trek over, but do visit patreon.com slash diffuse congruence where you can become a patron of the show. That is to say a monthly uh, supporter, uh, whether it's a dollar, five dollars, a hundred dollars, um, that'd be great. But uh, whatever you feel that you want to contribute to allow us to continue the work that we're doing, to continue the show, to improve its quality and and uh, and, 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 and uh, expand its outreach, um, you can do so by becoming a patron of the show. Nice. And uh, do you want to tell people our email address? And everything? Yeah, that's right. So um, you can um, email your comments, your feedback, your suggestions to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Uh, and and in, in addition to that, please do uh, leave us a star rating, a review on iTunes. That always helps, uh, as well as... Uh, wherever you download fine podcasts. And if people wanted to engage us on Facebook, sorry, they can they can reach us on facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. You can also reach out to Zucky at... Oh, yeah, you go to my website, uh, zuckyscorner.com. That's the A-K-I-S corner. And that's also my Twitter. That's also my Instagram. And I know you're you're on uh, Twitter. That's well. right. Uh, it's uh, Prevez F. Hammond. Okay. Uh, that wraps up episode 72 of this show, but we'll be back soon. Thank you, everybody, for listening.